Hello and welcome to our special edition of BizTalk, Financing the Greener Future. To address climate change, finance plays a key role. Large-scale investments are required to significantly reduce emissions. Meanwhile, vast amounts of financial resources are needed to adapt to the adverse effects and reduce the impacts of climate change. To understand more about this, we're joined by four distinguished guests today. Sebastian Eckhart, Practice Manager for Macroeconomics and Fiscal at World Bank. Tang Dingding, former Chair of Compliance Review Panel of Asian Development Bank. Ma Jun, Co-Chair of G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group. And Shuang Liu, China Finance Director at World Resources Institute. So welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. And Dr. Eckhart, let me start with you. November 9th is designated as Finance Day in the COP27 schedule. How important is climate finance in the event's agenda? So clearly, green finance is a central um, part of the agenda, not just of the COP27, but more broadly speaking, of, of the global uh, climate change agenda. Uh, clearly, financing needs, as you uh, pointed out, are significant both to achieve the ambitious mitigation targets and reduce greenhouse gas emissions across the world, but also to, of course, finance necessary investments in, in making economies more resilient, uh, including investments, of course, in infrastructure. Uh, and in this regard, uh, ensuring that financial markets uh, allocate capital uh, efficiently uh, to, to those needs uh, is absolutely vital for, for the world uh, to achieve its, its climate goals uh, going forward. Now, there's different dimensions to this discussion. There's, of course, a global dimension to it um, about mobilizing financing, especially for uh, developing countries mm. uh, to help uh, invest, uh, finance the investments that are necessary there. And then, of course, there is a, a dimension to it at the level of individual countries, for example, China, how to reform and, uh, and strengthen uh, green finance and green financial markets, financial markets in country to ensure that domestic savings and resources that are available are, are uh, mobilized efficiently to, to meet the needs in, in individual countries. Hmm. And Mr. Town, in your opinion, what can we expect at the COP27 in terms of announcements, initiatives and implementations? Uh, yeah, we have to say that uh, the implementation role or implementation uh, functions will, very, will be very much important for achieving the goal of the climate change. Uh, without, you know, underground implementation efforts, it is impossible to achieve it. However, if we want, you know, making that uh, uh, goals to be achieved and the more uh, progress can be achieved, Broadly, collaborations among different stakeholders will be also very much important, not only financial institutions or financial sector, but also academic and the think tank and even NGO CSO, they all need to be working together and supporting each other, not only for the climate change or for COP27, but also for uh, biodiversity like, you know, COP15. So therefore, you know, uh, for the implementation, in my, you know, views, it is, uh, you know, needed to uh, call for all, you know, stakeholders, holders working together. That is the, you know, fundamental basis for achieving that goal. Right. And Dr. Ma, we know that a lot of commitments about financing climate change were made at and after COP26. Uh, in your opinion, what progress has been made and where has progress been lacking? Uh, obviously, a lot of progress are being made in the space of green and sustainable finance globally. Uh, just to name a couple of international coordination mechanisms which I'm involved, for example, the G20. Uh, that started uh, a discussion on green finance as early as 2016. Mm -hmm. At that time, China initiated the uh, G20 Green Finance Study Group under the G20 platform, and now it's becoming the uh, G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group. And this working group has produced a roadmap for sustainable finance, which is guiding the international work in the coming few years. And for this year in particular, the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group is producing a transition finance framework, which I expect to be released uh, during the uh, COP time. And I think uh, a lot of discussions will be around how to mobilize financing for transition activities, namely enable the carbon intensive sector to move towards low carbon and net zero going forward. The other important uh, progress is uh, uh, the uh, harmonization of global sustainable finance standards. Uh, one aspect of that is uh, 
the IPSF work, which is called the International Platform for Sustainable Finance. And under that platform, there is a working group, uh, mm. which is co-led by China and Europe to produce a common ground taxonomy. And that taxonomy is intended to address a problem of segmentation uh, of uh, sustainable finance definitions. And uh, because of the common ground taxonomy, we're now able to move uh, capital more freely uh, between China and Europe. And uh, maybe one more thing to mention is uh, the uh, NGFS work on biodiversity. Uh, the finance sector has not paid enough attention until recently to biodiversity and preserving uh, the nature. But uh, the NGFS, namely the Essential Banks Network for Greening the Financial System, has launched a study which I co-chaired on the importance of finance in protecting biodiversity. That's something I think we'll be presenting to the uh, COP27 as well. Mm. And Ms. Liu, in your opinion, what will dominate the agenda of the COP27 discussions regarding uh, financial uh, initiatives? Thanks. Um, I believe that whether we will have a success finance negotiation during COP will determine the success of the COP uh, final results. Uh, specifically, I think there are three agendas on finance that we should pay attention to. Mm. First is that to what extent we can scale up the support for adaptation action. We see that countries must show how they can meet their commitment to double the adaptation finance, improve the quality of the finance, also ensure all the resources can reach the community where needed adaptation finance most. Second, the on the climate finance agenda is how we can address the loss and damage. And again, mm. countries must take very concrete progress towards creating financial arrangement for loss and damage. Last but not least, it is how that countries can provide reassurance that the 100, uh, 100 billion annual climate finance goal can finally be met and getting ready to set a new collective quantified goal on climate finance by 2025. Mm. Well Many have noted the adequacy, appropriateness, and predictability of climate finance in developing countries is key to achieving climate goals. And Dr. Edgard, what can be done to shore up financial resources for the developing world amid growing debt pressure? Meeting the financing needs of developing countries is concerned. I think it's clear that um, the international financial institutions have a role to play, including the World Bank, in terms of providing um, uh, resources to, to developing countries, including on adaptation, but also in some cases on the mitigation agenda. Now, what is also clear is that public sector financing is not going to be sufficient. So it's also important to attract more private financing into these, into these areas. Um, and for that, I think reforms are important. Reforms uh, in terms of financial markets, of course, and, and putting in place uh, infrastructure, including uh, uh, verifiable standards um, uh, and sort of a, a monitoring infrastructure that ensures that what is named green and labeled green is indeed green and to uh, mitigate risks of greenwashing. But it's also important to go beyond the financial sector, in my view, and to look at, at some of the uh, constraints, regulatory constraints um, in the sectors where investments are needed and to ensure that the regulatory environment, for example, in, in, in sectors like energy, uh, uh, in, in sectors also that are important for adaptation um, are conducive to private sector in investment because, of course, the financial market responds uh, and is very good at allocating uh, capital to uh, investments that generate uh, economic returns and that are viable. And for that viability, economic viability of investments uh, to indeed be, be there, often regulatory reforms in real sectors uh, are as important as reforms in the financial sector. Mm. And uh, if I may jump in, I'd sure. uh, like to add a few words on right. uh, this topic of developing countries' uh, uh, green finance. Sure. Um, the G20 is actually looking at this particular issue as well this year. Uh, it's mm. one of the three work streams under the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group on how to scale up the green finance for developing countries and for SMEs. Mm. I think a couple of bottlenecks we need to address, uh, uh, as Sebastian mentioned, uh, you know, we need to have the capacity uh, for uh, developing countries to utilize uh, uh, green finance, and uh, uh, we need MDBs to play more important roles, and we need pro uh, more products. 
Now, more specifically, I think uh, uh, de-risking facility is very important because a lot of developing countries, especially low-income countries, are regarded as a uh, high risk for you know, a variety of reasons, political risk, exchange risk, and uh, credit risk, and so on and so forth. So de-risking is important, and we need to help them uh, through uh, mechanisms such as multinational development banks. So the expansion of de-risking facility by institutions like uh, in the World Bank, ADB, AIB, I think is extremely important. Mm -hmm. The internal issues need to be overcome uh, that has uh, sort of restrained the expansion of de-risking and blended finance uh, right. as of today. The second major part is capacity. A lot of developing countries don't know how to uh, develop taxonomies, namely definition of green finance. Uh, they don't have the uh, disclosure requirements in place and they don't have the data uh, required to generate ESG information for uh, companies. That's why I think uh, a lot of green finance are unable to be channeled uh, to the uh, uh, emerging markets and SMEs. So mm. capacity building, again, from MDBs, I think, for developing countries is important. Uh, the final point is really on products. Um, a lot of uh, financial products uh, that enable the green finance development so far are actually for large uh, infrastructure projects. And these products are not suitable for SMEs, especially in those uh, you know, developing countries. That's why innovation is very important. And in this uh, G20 report, which we're putting out today, uh, uh, this year, um, we are highlighting uh, products such as uh, green supply chain financing. I think uh, it's a very important aspect uh, that the uh, financial sector need to look into uh, to enable uh, the channeling of financial resources uh, towards a developing country. Hmm. Well, Dr. Ma, let me stay with you. Uh, you. You've been promoting green investment in developing countries and you, you have also been co-chairing the uh, green investment principles for the Belt and Road. Uh, what are the contents of these principles and how did it get in implemented? The green investment principles for the Belt and Road, uh, we call it GIP in short, uh, started in 2018. Uh, it was initiated by China Green Finance Committee, which I here and the uh, city of London. Of course, it was uh, uh, joined by many other organizations, including uh, PII, uh, IFC, um, Pulse Institute, uh, World Economic Forum, and the BRBR. Um, the uh, principles were calling for investors investing in the Belt and Road to be greener. Uh, namely, we asked them to assess the uh, environmental impact of their projects, to disclose environmental information, to utilize uh, green financial instruments, um, to employ green supply chain methodologies, and so on. Over the past couple of years, the uh, principles were adopted by more than 40 global financial institutions. They collectively manage 40 trillion, actually more than 40 trillion US dollar on their balance sheet. And we have set up uh, three working groups to enhance the capacity for green investment. Mm. And the three working groups are working on, respectively, um, climate and environmental risk assessment, disclosure, and the product innovation. And recently, uh, we actually set up a couple of uh, regional uh, chapters for implementation of the principles uh, on the ground in emerging markets. And uh, one regional chapter, which was launched uh, about a year ago, uh, there was a Central Asian regional chapter. And the second one, uh, which we are about to announce, is the African regional chapter. Mm. And Mr. Town, uh, what is your views and comments on the financial needs of developing countries? Uh, yes, uh, at the moment, uh, I found that uh, most of the demand from the developing countries in the regard of climate change is coming from the adaptation and the capacity building. Mm. Uh, Dr. Ma already mentioned something about capacity building, but I want to you know something you know I want to emphasize is about uh, adaptation. That adaptation issues also very much, you know, relevance to the climate change issue or to, uh, to the biodiversity issue. Therefore, you know, when we think about how to support the developing country, making making great efforts to uh, change something about in you know, adaptation, adopt you know biodiversity uh, issues as a co benefits. That will be in the future is a key uh, areas that we can work in together for the developing countries. Because most of the developing countries is the um, is the how to say the uh, most countries facing the challenges coming from the climate disasters or climate uh, you know issues coming from the adaptation, mm. and uh, like you know China last year uh, you know uh, that we are facing 
very uh, difficult situations on the climate you know, situations, adaptations in different cities. That's mm -hmm. why uh, now uh, not only China, but also member of the developed countries making some of the efforts how to improve their you know, uh, cities, you know, resilience and the city's adaptation capacity. Uh, so maybe in the future, we're going to uh, support uh, developing countries in making more efforts on these adaptation efforts. But that you know, efforts needs to be supported by the you know, uh, developed countries and also financial institutions. Without mm. you know, their support, it's very much you know, difficult for them you know, to achieve relevant goals regarding to the climate change and adaptation. Thank mm. you. Well, Ms. Liu also pointed out the important, uh, importance of adaptation. In your opinion, uh, how large is the gap for adaptation for developing countries? And uh, we know that rich nations agreed to provide $100 billion per year to help fund uh, emissions reduction in developing countries by 2023. At the latest, any progress can be expected on that front? Yeah, uh, maybe to share some figures uh, from the recent uh, statistics that OECD actually published on the mm. progress towards the 100 uh, billion annual climate finance goal, which includes uh, the finance that the developed countries have provided for developing countries on both mitigation and adaptation. And where we see the gap in meeting this 100 billion goal, according to OECD's data, that it has only been uh, just a little bit about 80 uh, uh, billion uh, climate finance has been provided by the developed countries to developing countries. So that gap needs to be met very soon. Mm. And also beyond 2025, there's no concrete agreement on what the goal on climate finance should be. It has to start from at least 100 billion, but even more. And also beyond adaptation finance, um, loss and damage, as we mentioned, will be another uh, topic um, that will be uh, paying, that will attract a lot of the attention uh, during COP27. This is another essential measure of success for the climate negotiation. And um, even the most effective adaptation measures cannot prevent all the loss and damages. So, uh, which are the present, the present day reality for vulnerable people in a lot of the developing countries. So the discussion on what funding arrange, arrangement can be achieved uh, for loss and damage, um, that will be uh, very, very central to the negotiated agenda. Hmm. And how much will ongoing world events such as the energy and food crisis, COVID-19 pandemic, overshadow climate actions and resources needed to address climate change, Dr. Eckhart? Well, I think uh, in some sense, these recent events reinforce the importance of, of the climate change agenda, notwithstanding, of course, that uh, we see across the world that, uh, you know, short run uh, crises often distract from these longer term objectives. But I think if anything, the energy crisis and uh, also, frankly, the natural disasters, the fact that we experienced one, one of the warmest years in, in history, uh, last year with 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 devastating droughts uh, 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 across across the world, I think reinforces the need to to act on on climate change and and act with urgency. Um, so I would hope that this gives impetus uh, to the to the COP27 to really uh, uh, step up commitments and and policy actions uh, to to address climate risks going forward. Um, I do think I want to mention this this point on. Uh, uh, damage and loss. I think this is a very important uh, part of the story. And again, I do think that financial markets can play a very important role in in helping to manage those risks and, and to pool risks, for example, to provide uh, disaster risk insurance and other means of, of uh, quickly and efficiently uh, mobilizing financing in case uh, damages and losses are incurred, uh, both at the community and, and, and uh, level, but also in some cases, even at the individual levels where this kind of financial protection can be part of a, uh, an adaptation strategy for to protect households from the impacts of climate uh, case, even in a world where where some of the worst effects are hopefully mitigated by strong action uh, across across the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Mar, in your opinion, how are we doing on greening the economic recovery? Um, now, if you're talking about uh, greening the uh, recovery globally, I think there's a lot of discussion in the past couple of years, uh, mm -hmm. uh, especially in Europe, on um, green recovery uh, using fiscal and financial resources to 
uh, support the recovery um, by uh, channeling a larger portion of the financial resources to green related uh, projects at the same time, generating jobs and the economic growth. Uh, in China, um, the Green Finance Initiative has started uh, actually a long time ago. Uh, formally, I think we launched it in 2016 when the PBOC um, published the uh, Green Finance Guidelines along with a couple of other ministries. So uh, this sort of green recovery scene has been going on for, for a while, uh, not just in the COVID-related uh, uh, period. And uh, uh, what we did in China is uh, uh, building what we call ecosystem of green finance, including taxonomy, which is the definition of green activities and disclosure requirement that requires the issuer or the borrower to disclose environmental and climate related information and product innovation, which will enable all kinds of green uh, projects to be financed. And uh, finally, I think more importantly, uh, it's really the incentives uh, from mm -hmm. the central bank, from the fiscal authorities to mobilize and catalyze private sector resource uh, right. towards uh, green uh, economic activities. Mm. Well, well, Mr. Tang, uh, we know that in some developed countries, uh, the uh, environmental commitments took a back seat due to the worsening energy crisis. Are you worried about that? Uh, I, I knew at the moment uh, some of the difficulties, you know, they're facing um, to uh, contribute more financial resources to the climate change, in particular to the developing countries. Mm. However, um, I I have to say that it is you know the trends of the uh, movements for climate change. Nobody can take it back, but uh, still you know uh, maybe difficult negotiations will be happened during the COP twenty uh, seven, and uh, I do believe that uh, adaptation uh, financial resources and uh, how to supporting developing countries and making great efforts to this in particular for Africa region. I knew that the 20, uh, COP27 will have uh, some of maybe events relating to these topics to assisting Africa you know, countries to make uh, energy transition and uh, making more investments of the renewable energy there. But however, you know, still some of the difficulties they're facing uh, let's uh, see what happens after 20 uh, uh, after cap you know 27 and uh, maybe some progress can be achieved from that mm. and ms liu in your opinion how will this ongoing energy crisis affect the uh, transition towards renewables what we have noticed is that with the ongoing energy and food crisis, uh, that will potentially reduce uh, the level of public finance that's available from the developing con developed countries to support the climate efforts in developing countries. Uh, most importantly, a lot of the current uh, support provided by developed countries is in the format of the Overseas Development Assistance, mm. or ODA, which is so far the largest source of international financing for a lot of the low income countries to support their uh, climate efforts. If there will be a further reduce on the ODA or the overseas development assistance, that will affect the level of uh, the efforts that developing countries can conduct. And that comes back again to where and how fast we can meet the 100 billion climate finance goal and what will be a more ambitious goal we can set up after 2025. Hmm. And we know that green finance has developed rapidly in the past years. And Dr. Edgard, what's your view on the global cooperation of sustainable finance initiatives? Well, I think there are many initiatives um, globally to to try to harmonize, for example, taxonomies and, and green finance standards to collaborate, of course, on these. Uh, I think those are important. There are also efforts, of course, to uh, mobilize financing uh, for developing countries uh, through the MDB system uh, in many ways to, to then uh, catalyze uh, and leverage a more private sector financing. Um, so those are important. Uh, global initiatives, but I do think that these global initiatives need to be complemented with with further steps uh, at at the country level. And again, uh, China is a is a good example where uh, the green finance agenda has really been, uh, in many ways, China has been has been uh, a leader there. 
uh, developing uh, uh, the green finance markets. It's, it's in fact, uh, China is home to the largest uh, uh, green finance markets by by some measures, uh, both in terms of loans, green fi fi uh, green loans uh, and green bonds. But of course, there is still uh, much more potential and opportunity to leverage financial markets uh, going forward, and and also sharing some of this experience uh, that, that China has uh, globally. So I think this is important. Um, to have this kind of, in my view, two-pronged approach. One is global initiatives to to standard to harmonize standards and so on, and to mobilize financing, especially for for developing developing countries, uh, combined with with efforts at the country level to to put in place the reforms and then build the necessary capacity uh, to also leverage uh, domestic resources where they are available. Mm. Dr. Yeah. Ma, I, I just want to go to you now. You have also played a key role in driving international cooperation on green finance. For example, uh, the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group is an important platform for global coordination of sustainable finance initiatives. Can you tell us a bit more about this and what is its major achievements in recent years? Uh, as I said briefly, the uh, G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group uh, produced uh, the uh, G20 Sustainable Finance Roadmap last year, which is a very important document guiding uh, international coordination for the coming few years. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, uh, as I was uh, trying to uh, follow up on Sebastian's point of coordination, uh, mm -hmm. this is the coordination mechanism at the international level, uh, because the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group is now inviting all major international organizations which are involved in green system finance to participate in a progress report review process. And we are conducting this on an annual basis. For example, uh, recently in the latest uh, version of the G20 system finance uh, working group report, we have a section on how each of the international organization has uh, performed uh, in terms of pushing uh, for green system finance development and what are the agendas going forward and how they can coordinate with each other. Just to give you a few examples, uh, um, the key elements of sustainable finance would involve things like taxonomy, disclosure, risk analysis, uh, products, and so on and so forth. So on the taxonomy side, we involve the agency like uh, IPSF, which is producing the common ground taxonomy, uh, to discuss with the G20 uh, on how to uh, make progress towards uh, enhancing comparability and the uh, interoperability of system of finance taxonomy. And on the disclosure side, the G20 uh, endorsed the launch of ISSB, which is hugely important in this space because there are too many different standards, frameworks, uh, principles for disclosure, which is confusing uh, the financial market. And we need to coordinate by producing a set of internationally recognized uh, baseline standard for disclosure. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did under the G20 platform uh, to support uh, the work of ISSB. And also we support the NGFS, which has produced a set of scenarios for climate risk analysis. And uh, uh, partly because of G20 support, uh, these scenarios produced by NGFS is able to spread or uh, disseminate more effectively uh, to the international community. And uh, uh, one more example of what we are doing this year under the G20 is the transition finance framework. And uh, this is becoming more important because uh, uh, you know, more and more countries realize that uh, we should be financing not only the pure green projects like renewables and electric vehicles, but also finance the carbon intensive companies for them to move towards net zero. And for them, I think the amount of finance that's needed is probably even bigger than the pure green projects uh, because we have so many companies in the sectors such as uh, steel, cement, coal-fired power generation, paper, petrochemical, uh, transportation and building, they all need financing for decarbonization. And for that purpose, a framework is needed to define what activities are qualified for um, transition finance and how the transition activities should disclose um, their uh, environmental and climate benefits and what are the financial products that are suitable for transition and uh, how uh, we can ensure just transition in the process. By just transition, I mean that the uh, in the process of decarbonization, we need to make sure that they are not generating too much of a negative social implication, for example, uh, unemployment. And uh, mm. for that, uh, we need to mobilize resources not only from the public sector, uh, for example, uh, in terms of provision of social security uh, benefits, but also the private sector, the financiers, they need to encourage 
the uh, corporates receiving transition finance to think about how to mitigate the unemployment uh, uh, situation, for example, by developing retraining program, reskilling program, and so on, and incentivize corporates to do so. Indeed, and these are uh, very important issues. And Mr. Town, uh, you've also worked on international cooperation and exchanges for a long time. Uh, in your opinion, what more can be done to boost the cooperation? Uh, that is a very uh, important. Uh, we do recognize the importance of the international cooperation uh, because not only developed uh, country but also developing country also are facing big challenges regarding to the climate change, regarding to the biodiversity. And uh, many of the not only uh, financial you know, shortage issues for the developing country but also for the developed country. They need contributions coming from the developing countries and they need working together between developed and the developing world. Uh, even, you know, for the uh, MDB uh, financial institutions, we feel that we need to uh, working together with different uh, academic, you know, um, and the environment and the think tank because we need a lot of uh, technical tools and database in order to better understand how to identify the risk of the uh, biodiversity, risk of the climate change in the process of the project development and the implementation in order to find the good solutions. So therefore, you know, we feel that in the future, so maybe more collaborations, collaborations and the collaboration is needed between developed world and the developing world, between, you know, a developing country themselves, between, you know, uh, financial institutions and other stakeholders. So therefore, you know, I want to say, I want to you know, emphasize the importance of the international cooperation, not only for the climate change, but also for the biodiversity. Right. And Ms. Liu, what more can be done to uh, scale up support from uh, multinational development banks and other uh, development finance institutions? Yeah, uh, building upon some of the peer experts have shared, I, I think one um, ask uh, for the multilateral development banks and also bilateral and other development financial institutions is the nature of the finance they can channel to developing countries and also the communities in those countries. Uh, the majority of the current funding we have seen that's been channeled by the multilateral development banks and other development financial institutions are loans, uh, right. which means that the developing countries will have to pay back uh, to those who lend those loans. However, an alternative can be that the majority of those development finance can be in the format of grant, mm. which will not only provide resources to support efforts in developing countries, but also can work with um, the current debt stress that's mm. really happening to a lot of the developing countries. So the, the debt stress um, uh, in developing countries um, is the constraints that prevent developing countries from taking on more loans which can provide the very much needed resources for them to work on climate change efforts. Indeed, many countries are facing solvency problems. And uh, scaling up investment and finance also plays a key role in delivering on climate goals. And Dr. Edgard, you have now prepared country climate and development reports for several countries. Uh, the report stresses the importance of mobilizing private sector financing. What recommendations do you have to mobilize financing at scale and what makes China different from other countries? So indeed, the World Bank has, uh, is in the process of preparing uh, what we call the country climate and development diagnostic for several countries, including uh, China, which we just launched uh, two weeks ago. Um, these reports aim to basically integrate uh, climate uh, considerations and climate action into a coherent strategy that also ensures uh, development and makes uh, sure that synergies between cl achieving climate goals and development goals are realized while some of the risks that are also there uh, are being managed. Um, now, I think um, to your question about the China uh, report, I think for China, I think we have three relevant findings that I think uh, resonate well with today's discussion. The first one is that uh, the report argues that uh, achieving China's uh, climate goals, namely peaking carbon emissions before 2030 and achieving carbon neutrality by 2060, are both economically and technically feasible, uh, but they require two things to happen. One is 
uh, uh, mobilization of quite significant uh, investment. Uh, in fact, the report finds that about 17 trillion uh, of additional investment are needed just to meet the needs in the transport and energy sector, two, mm. two of the main sectors of uh, carbon emissions in China. And the second finding is that uh, while financing is necessary, uh, it's not it's not uh, sufficient, and that um, mobilizing financing will be will need to be accompanied uh, by by reforms reforms uh, and policies uh, to to adjust relative prices in the economy and to reflect the social cost of carbon through various forms either regulations explicit carbon pricing uh, of course in china's case the emissions trading uh, system that has been put in place but also broader structural reforms to allow markets uh, including financial markets to respond to those changing uh, price signals efficiently and to mobilize this investment. And in this context, of course, uh, China is a case in point. Uh, public financing will have to be used for certain uh, things, including uh, de-risking private, private investment, uh, pa pa partly addressing some of the uh, distributional implications and protecting some of the communities that and industries that will likely be negatively affected by a move towards decarbonization, as, as uh, Dr. Ma has also highlighted, ensuring a just transition. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you will also need private investment, uh, including in sectors like energy and transport, um, where a conducive regulatory and policy environment is, is, is necessary, together with financial sector reforms to, uh, to allow financial sector to innovate and, and provide the type of green uh, finance products that can help uh, the private sector to basically uh, carry out some of these investments that are increasingly good for the climate, but they are also good uh, in an economic sense and can help generate the next wave of innovation, job creation uh, in, 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 in the economy. Right. And Dr. Ma, let me go to you. You said a few times uh, to the press that China will need to mobilize 487 trillion uh, yuan in the coming 30 years for green and low carbon investment. What are the remaining challenges that we need to overcome in order to achieve this goal? I think Sebastian mentioned the number of 17 trillion. That's US dollar, right? And uh, we were talking about 480 something trillion RMB in the coming 30 years uh, for China to mobilize uh, for uh, green and uh, low carbon activities. And uh, this was an estimate coming out of the China Green Finance Committee in our report last year. Uh, on annual average basis, this translates into roughly 16 trillion RMB per year, uh, mm -hmm. which needs to be mobilized. I think only half of that is mobilized already, and uh, the gap is huge. Um, mm -hmm. So going forward, we need to modify, improve our green financial system in uh, several aspects. One is the uh, uh, definition of green and the transition activities. Now, we do have good definitions already on green side. We actually have three taxonomies, one for green loan, one for green bonds, one for green projects. But now uh, we are working on a taxonomy on transition activities, which will list the uh, type of qualified transition activities in all carbon intensive sectors, for example, coal-fired power generation, steel, cement, petrochemical, and so on. So by listing these activities clearly in the table, uh, the finances such as the banks will be able to target these activities and give them favorable uh, financing terms to support their uh, decarbonization efforts. And the second thing is really about disclosure. We do have some disclosure requirements initially for the uh, issuers or borrowers to disclose environmental information such as how much you have improved in terms of uh, air quality, uh, water quality and so on. But now we're moving towards carbon related disclosure. Uh, we will be requiring the corporates and also the financial institutions such as the banks to report the carbon intensity of their activities, including lending activities. So by doing so, uh, they will know uh, the current level of carbon intensity and what kind of uh, carbon reduction they can achieve in the coming few years through green finance. Mm. And the third um, effort is to incentivize decarbonization. And uh, uh, at the central bank level last year, the PBOC introduced this uh, decarbonization facility which offers very low cost funding through commercial banks. The funding is as cheap as 1.75% annualized rate. Uh, obviously, it reduces the funding cost of the uh, projects. Uh, at project level, uh, some of the renewable projects are now receiving uh, loans at a rate of only 2.9%, which is much lower than before, largely mm -hmm. because of this uh, uh, decarbonization facility. And going forward, we should have more of such facilities, including for transition finance. 
Um, also, product innovation is important. Um, previously, we um, created a lot of products for dealing with uh, pollution, like you know, air pollution, water pollution, land contamination, and so on. But now we need to create financial products that are suitable for decarbonization. And some of the products are linked to decarbonization performance. For example, if the company uh, can reduce carbon uh, more uh, aggressively than the expected uh, target, then this company will be able to receive low-cost funding. So that kind of incentive is building uh, into the product design. Mm. So, so many things to do. I'm just giving you a couple of examples of what's going on uh, in uh, financing uh, carbon reduction uh, projects, but uh, certainly there'll be more uh, going forward. Right. And Mr. Tang, what are your views and comments on how to further scale up investment and finance in the sector? Uh, in my views, I feel that the private sector will be a uh, very big potential, you know, areas we need to, you know, encourage them, you know, making more efforts. Uh, of course, you know, that's based on the uh, very good, you know, uh, policy environment. Without, you know, the policy, you know, and uh, environment that includes incentives and some of maybe uh, good, you know, product that can be provided, including the technical support, technical tool, that will be very much, you know, difficult for the financial sectors to, to, uh, to evolve. In fact, a few days ago, I met a number of the head of the private companies. So they're trying to make some of the contributions and uh, interventions in the areas of climate change. However, they're facing not only, you know, uh, financial issues, but also some of the technical issues. They're, uh, they're going to be, you know, overcome by outside, not themselves. So therefore, you know, they want to more um, uh, uh, technical guidance coming from the academic uh, group or coming from the environment group, including think tank. But at the same time, they're going to maybe ask more good, you know, favorable conditions and policies to support the financial institutions, in particular private, you know, financial institutions can be deeply involved in the climate change, including biodiversity. Otherwise, difficult for the private sector, you know, to make some of the uh, contributions and efforts in this regard. Uh, and also, of course, by the end, impossible to achieve our goals from the big, you know, gap of the financial resources that Dr. Ma mentioned, half. Half, you know, gap, in fact, we're fitting, but where is the coming from of the financial resources? Uh, private sector will be the good you know, potential, but based on the, you know, what policies, what incentives that can be provided. Mm. And Ms. Liu, uh, in your opinion, how should the government better align their goals with the private sector? And should we worry about the risk of uh, greenwashing? Uh, yes, I think we should be careful of how to prevent greenwashing uh, from the private financial institutions. I think one of the useful tool is to increase the transparency, accountability, and also having more tracking of where the progress has been from, uh, for instance, the private financial institutions. As we noticed uh, last year during COP26, there are a lot of announcements and commitments from private financial institutions on the net, net zero commitment, uh, which uh, includes like by which year they will want to uh, for their portfolio to meet the net zero target. I think what we'll need uh, will be a large tracking initiative showing not only that the progress the private financial institutions have made towards the net zero target, which very often will be around 2040, but also we will need the private financial institutions to disclose their roadmap and also the short-term and mid-term targets to check if they are on the track to meet the net zero targets um, around 2040. And also on another level of uh, the accountability can be also on what detailed information that the private financial institutions need to disclose, which can help us to again track if they are on the right track of meeting the net zero target. This can include, for instance, uh, a disclosure on their investment in fossil fuel and also a disclosure on their transition plan of walking away from the fossil fuel sector and also some of the carbon intensity sector, as Dr. Ma has said, how they can use um, some of the ongoing discussion on the transition uh, financial standards. That's another way that private financial institutions can better disclose their information and making mm. sure they are on the right track to achieve the targets. May I add a few words on that? Sure, Dr. Ma, go ahead. Yeah, now regarding greenwashing, this is something uh, 
uh, you know, we had in mind the, as early as 2014 when we began to design the uh, green financial policy framework in China. And of course, it's an ongoing, uh, uh, you know, uh, discussion uh, topic. Um, I think uh, three aspects are very important. Number one, uh, we need to clearly define what green activities are. Uh, if there's no definition or too many definitions, uh, it's going to be creating a lot of green ocean opportunities. Uh, I heard that the, in the world there are uh, probably 200 different definitions of green uh, activities already. Some are produced by national governments, some are by NGOs, some are by financial institutions. So mm -hmm. if there are too many definitions, then you know anyone can just pick one definition and claim I meet this requirement, and this may be the lower requirement. Right. Um, so this is a source of greenwashing, uh, which I think efforts need to be made to gradually improve the consistency of uh, green finance definition, namely in the form of taxonomy or other alignment approach. The second thing is uh, uh, disclosure, as uh, uh, Shuang has mentioned. It's extremely mm. important. Um, part of the problem today is that uh, there are too many uh, uh, requirements of disclosure which are inconsistent with each other. Um, you know, different countries putting different requirements. Some are mandatory, some are semi-compulsory, some are voluntary, and uh, uh, even the same indicator uh, which may have different meanings you know, from different countries. And that's also creating opportunity for greenwashing. The third thing is that even if the data are disclosed according to some requirements, uh, such data may not be true. Um, and uh, to address that problem, we need to have verification from third party. So it's an ecosystem uh, really to um, you know, generate uh, uh, checks and balance on the quality of the data and uh, reduce greenwashing, namely, better definition, better disclosure requirements, and a better verification system. Right. Thank you. And the World Bank has just launched the uh, China Country Climate and Development Report. Uh, Dr. Adkart, uh, what are the highlights of this report, especially regarding the development of green finance in China, and what are some of the remaining challenges? So building on the, on the response to your previous question, just focusing on, on the aspect of uh, green finance in the report, mm. Uh, what we highlight is very much along the line of uh, what we've been discussing <laughs> during uh, th this segment, uh, which is about, on the financial sector side, uh, is about putting in place a good infrastructure based on a, on a harmonized taxonomy across different markets, so between uh, loans, uh, uh, bonds and equity, um, to put in place, secondly, uh, requirements on the corporate side uh, to disclose uh, information about inv investments um, and to put in place a good uh, verification infrastructure that ensures that that data is is reliable. Now, I think what we what we say is that in many ways, while green fin financial markets have grown uh, quite uh, rapidly in China, uh, more potential is there and, in fact, is needed in order for China to meet these investment needs that we have been talking about. Um, and if, for example, if we look at uh, um, in, in, at various uh, financial markets, so in, 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 in case of loans, which is the dominant form of uh, financing available in, in, in China's economy, only 8% or so of the current loan book are labeled as green. Uh, so there is still, despite very rapid growth in, in recent years, there is still uh, potential to scale up. Perhaps more importantly, outside of um, uh, debt markets, uh, if we look at bonds and um, um, uh, especially equity markets, there we see even more growth potential. And we know that uh, this is important because um, there is some part of the investment need that is basically investment in existing technologies, scaling up, uh, you know, renewable uh, energy uh, generation, uh, investing in grids, uh, and so on. But there's also an important part uh, uh, of the investment needs that relate to essentially investing in emerging new technologies. And there, loan financing is is often not the best way uh, to, to finance those sort of venture uh, 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 in innovative uh, activities that require, for example, a different type of risk, risk sharing and often require early stage equity financing and risk capital. And there we do see that in, in, in China's case, uh, there is, is, is uh, a huge uh, gap there. And I think this is probably the frontier to move from these sort of uh, from the progress that has been made in some of the more traditional 
uh, finding instruments into more of these uh, frontier markets and to also ensure that some of the financing goes into financing uh, uh, innovation and, and investments in, in research and development to generate the technologies that China and the rest of the world will need uh, to achieve the carbon goals uh, in the long run. Right. And Mr. Tang, what's your views and comments on the development of China's uh, sustainable finance markets and what new and innovative finance instruments and solutions can we explore? Uh, Chinese government and uh, the financial institutions, in fact, uh, uh, did uh, very great efforts in these you know, areas in the past uh, uh, five or seven years. And we have to say that a number of the good you know, progress achieved, not only for the uh, pilot you know, activities in different cities, different promises and in different financial institutions, but also a number of the financial products has been developed to, uh, to, uh, uh, to assist uh, financial institutions and the local governments achieving the goal of the um, environmental protection and uh, achieving the goal of the sustainabilities in different cities. However, we're still facing some of the lack of the maybe uh, demand and the necessity uh, actions that need to be taken in the near future. So for instance, as I mentioned, we need to encourage more private sector, you know, uh, to involve the financial um, uh, uh, investment in China, uh, in the areas not only for the uh, renewable energy, but also for the adaptations of the uh, city for the biodiversity, but currently and not much, you know, financial resources flowed from uh, central uh, public sectors of the financial and the private financial institutions into that, you know, areas instead of the, you know, uh, climate change, instead of the energy, um, renewable energy. But sometimes we're facing very uh, urgent, you know, demands regarding to the energy uh, storation uh, facilities. Without energy storation, you know, energy impossible to moving uh, generated uh, renewable energy from Western parts of China to the central and the Eastern part of China. Uh, but that's, you know, a, a business and a commercial scale, you know, uh, energy storage uh, facilities now uh, needs to be very, you know, uh, strongly, you know, supported by the financial institutions and also to be deeply involved by the, uh, how to say, energy uh, sectors uh, cooperation. And without that, you know, facilities in the in the futures, I'm not quite sure that any renewable energy sectors can be smoothly, you know, developed and enlarging in China, but also in other regions and, and other countries. So I'm looking forward to uh, more financial resources coming from the public sector and the private sector, including MDBs, can be, you know, uh, used for supporting energy uh, storage facilities. Uh, and also uh, renewable, you know, uh, generations from the energy restoration. So let's just see what happens after the uh, COP27 in the areas of the energy restoration uh, served for the uh, renewable energy. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, I'm not quite sure, you know, renewable energy can be developed, uh, you know, quickly. Mm. And Dr. Ma, China's uh, green lending and green bond market has quickly become one of the largest in the world. What do you think are the most important factors that have contributed to this success and what is your vision for future innovation and development? As I said, the green financial system is an ecosystem. Uh, it's uh, not a standalone product. Uh, what we need uh, at least uh, involve a couple of pillars, uh, including, as I said, taxonomy, disclosure requirements, policy incentive, then products, mm. and also a lot of trading rules related to uh, these products. So. Um, we realized in the early days, um, as early as I think uh, as in 2014, that we need to take a top-down approach uh, to design a green financial system. Um, and that's why we came up with this uh, uh, Green Finance Guideline 2016, which was jointly issued by seven ministries. So it was a coordination internally within China. We involved the PBOC, the Ministry of Finance, the other financial regulators, uh, including those on banking, uh, insurance and securities, as well as the environmental ministry. So all ministries uh, in this consortium came up with their uh, contributions to uh, the policy uh, uh, making process and also the uh, uh, ecosystem development. That's what we call the top-down approach. And that really helped uh, in China. And as you said, we quickly became the largest green lending market in the past few years. And we're now the second largest green bond market 
without this uh, government coordination, I think it was impossible to move that fast. Uh, because if you only rely on the private sector to coordinate on issues such as taxonomy or disclosure, it will take ages. Um, you know, uh, sometimes the private sector won't agree on a certain definition of green activities and it can drag on and on. So I think the government has to play this convening role uh, in, uh, you know, developing these rules and infrastructure. Mm. Of course, it's not just the government. Uh, it's actually a model of private and public sector partnership. A lot of uh, policies and standards, in fact, uh, were drafted by private sector experts, uh, including those organized by China's Green Finance Committee. And uh, so the interaction within China between the public and private sector is uh, extremely healthy, in my view. Uh, we involve the private sector experts in the development of standards, such as taxonomy and disclosure requirements, and the, in all kinds of consultation on product development between the government and the private sector. I think that was a key success factor uh, for China's green finance you know, as of today. But of course, we need to have more private sector initiative going forward. For example, uh, the private sector investors need to be uh, more uh, uh, sort of a green oriented uh, so that uh, they have a preference for green products. And with such a preference, uh, they can, you know, uh, uh, develop a, uh, a larger green portfolio uh, within their organization and therefore uh, giving some sort of price premium to the uh, green products, including green bonds. Mm. Well, uh, Ms. Liu, could you share with us your uh, views and comments on the future development of China's green finance market? Uh, yes, I can probably um, also share for the perspective of how China's investment overseas can be also part of the China's over, overall right. uh, green investment. So I think many of us were commenting on how important it is to mobilize private finance with public finance. And for overseas investment that China is providing, this is also very important. And I think there could be more efforts uh, in coordinating uh, private and public finance. Take the example of the renewable energy project that China has been investing overseas. We have seen actually there could be a large potential of private finance that can be unlocked by uh, public finance uh, from China and potentially also from the other uh, development financial institutions. We've noticed actually for the upstream process of the project development, which is to uh, efforts to make projects bankable or the efforts to prepare those projects. Uh, in the past, actually, uh, there's been a few investment made by the Chinese public uh, uh, investors uh, to support the efforts to make a projects bankable. However, if there could be more efforts and um, resources allocated by the public investors in China to help host countries in providing uh, and more bankable projects that can actually help uh, to unlock the private uh, capital from China who has a big appetite in the overseas renewable energy projects. And that will be one example of how the coordination between the different investors can help to mobilize uh, the private finance with public finance. Indeed, more needs to be done to further unlock the uh, potential of green finance in the future. And that's all the time we have for today. Thanks again to all of you. Sebastian Eckhart, Practice Manager for Macroeconomics and Fiscal at World Bank. Tang Dingding, former Chair of Compliance Review Panel of Asian Development Bank. Ma Jun, Co-Chair of G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group. Shuang Liu, China Finance Director at World Resources Institute. And that's all for our special edition of BizTalk, Financing the Greener Future. Thanks for being with us. Until next time, bye for now.